Um, hello and welcome to this episode of the Teacher Toolkit podcast and on this episode I am absolutely privileged to be hosting Joe Dale. Obviously I'm Libby Isaac, hopefully you know me by now um, and we're going to have a really great chat. Now what I'd like you to do Joe, if that's okay, is to sort of introduce yourself, give a little bit of background information and you know tell me one, one thing that sort of makes you stand out so to speak. Okay, well, first of all, thanks ever so much, Libby, for this opportunity of coming onto the podcast. Um, I'm a big, big fan of podcasts, and it's a, always a privilege and, and lovely to have a chat with a fellow podcaster. So thank you so much uh, for the uh, for the opportunity. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so to start off with, for those people that don't know me, I'm a former languages teacher. I taught uh, secondary school level for three years and then 10 years at middle school level on the Art of White, which is where I'm living right now, and I've lived here for over 20 years now. Uh, for the last 12 years or so, I've been um, uh, an independent consultant, focusing on, um, or the bread and butter of what I do is working with language teachers, but I'm also doing more and more cross-curricular work. Um, so I've been all over the world, um, been to places like Australia, New Zealand, North America, um, the Middle East, South America, all over Europe, uh, before Brexit, of course. And uh, since the, the start of the pandemic, I've been uh, working incredibly hard doing lots of webinars, um, as well as a whole set of free webinars for the Association for Language Learning, known as the TILT webinars, uh, TILT standing for Technology and Language Teaching. And we've done over 140 of those, all completely available for free on my YouTube channel and also on the AWL London website. And for, for a, a fact that maybe people don't know about me, um, uh, my first podcast was back in 2006. So I'm very much an early adopter. Mm -hmm. And um, over the years, I sort of uh, fallen in in and out of love with podcasting, but def I'm definitely going through another renaissance at the moment, and that's why I've got this really lovely microphone here, which is <laughs> which is an ATR twenty one hundred X, a dynamic microphone, and I should sound really cool even I get right up close to it like this, and I sound almost like a DJ like that. There we are. <laughs> you'll you'll have to give me some tips. So uh, obviously we we didn't record this, but when me and Joe came on the chat just now, we did compare our mics, so uh, <laughs> it's definitely something that uh, he's very proud of, and absolutely right as well. Um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, what inspired you to be a teacher in the first place? Because obviously this is for uh, all, all the teachers out there. Of course, yeah. So um, I, I was inspired. Well, my, essentially my background is uh, my mum, my dad uh, are both um, teachers. Um, uh, my my brothers, uh, some of my brothers are teachers as well. So I, I very much come from a teaching background. And uh, at school, um, languages were just something that um, I was good at as well as maths. And so I just went with um, what I was good at. And then as a result of that, once I'd done my degree, and I also had um, uh, straight after my degree, I had two years in uh, French speaking Canada in Quebec, uh, where I was um, like a, a, a language assistant, because I wanted to get a bit of experience of what it would be like to have some sort of sort of classroom experience. And also I had um, a year in Montpellier as well as part of my um, wow. degree um, to get my uh, speaking French up to scratch. And I just sort of fell into it really. So uh, first of all, I was um, thinking about being a TEFL teacher. And then uh, having had the two years in Canada, I then came back and I thought I would do a, um, a PGC. I also did um, a TEFL uh, certificate as well in Canterbury. Uh, directly after coming back from Canada, and then I um, uh, did a, a PGC in, uh, in Bangor in North Wales, and uh, and then once I once I'd done that and I'd had some uh, my my two teaching practices, I realised that actually uh, I didn't want to be a TEFL teacher; I wanted to be a French teacher instead, and um, just went from there. Really, you're you're a bit like the yin to my yang. So I am absolutely not very good at languages, never have <laughs> been, or maths actually. So I'm a, I'm more of a historian, stroke humanities. English, although I'm not very good at spelling, as my mother would tell you. But my, um, so my my sister's teacher, my brother-in-law's teacher, my nan was a teacher. We all teach history. Um, but my my father-in-law was um, a language specialist, and he was a um, MFL teacher. And he actually he spoke twelve Baltic languages. Sadly, wow. passed away now. But he he was in the Cold War because he could speak so many of those languages. So um, so this is for him as well. I'm sure he'd absolutely <laughs> love to have spoken to you about everything <laughs> to do with MFL. So it's definitely in my family. Cool. Um, so as we're talking about MFL. Um, I, I work in the secondary se sector, so I have been a head of school and uh, like, I, I'm not a head of school anymore, so I've got a really young family and I've got other things to sort of focus on. But 
one of the things that really struck me within that role was we just couldn't recruit. Well, we found it very difficult to recruit for MFL teachers. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit about that, especially as we've got Brexit and we've just had the pandemic as well. So could you just sort of t- tell me your sort of insights into that as well? That'd be really interesting. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, um, unfortunately, certainly in the national press for many, many years, there's been lots of negative stories around uh, languages. And I think that one of the things that I'm particularly proud of uh, if not the thing I'm most proud of, is um, helping to nurture and create the um, the, the MFL Twitter arty, the social mm. media community of language teachers um, from from the UK and from um, from around the world, and the way in which the hashtag has um, uh, brought a lot of positivity into the world um, for many many years, and certainly particularly because of the pandemic, the way in which people have come together even more and shared even more, and the way in which. Um, uh, for those the tilt webinars that I talked about, the the fact that we had all that that feeling of solidarity of all being together, say a hundred people all watching webinar at the same time, uh, and and sharing ideas. So to me, that's a real success story and uh, a, a silver lining, if you like, around the pandemic. The way in which because all these networks um, had been um, there for many 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 years, um, the, the the early adopters getting into Twitter years and years ago and establishing these communities and so obviously with the languages one in particular um to me it's it was a it has been a massive boon the fact that we had those communities established already and so that we were able to help everybody straight off the bat and so um i think that's been a really really positive news story uh and in relation to obviously things like brexit then that will have an effect on the attitudes of young people i think um in fact there was um um, an article this week um, in uh, the um, uh, the Independent, I think it was, around the influence of parents' um, attitudes towards languages for their mm. children. And any language teacher, you know, knows that already. And unfortunately, at parents' evenings and things like that, you'll hear parents saying, well, I was never good at languages at, at, uh, at school. Therefore, you know, why should my son or daughter try at languages? Um, but yeah. But teachers in general are very resilient people. I think language teachers in particular are very resilient and they'll just um, come back with something positive and and, and continue to uh, promote the value of languages for all the different reasons, for, for cultural reasons, for um, cognitive reasons of um, being able to... Uh, 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 t- uh, t- to wade off um, uh, Alzheimer's supposedly by five years if you're, if you're a linguist, that, those sorts of important things like that, mm-hmm. uh, which I'm sure that um, a, a standard teenager would take on board, um, <laughs> as well as uh, uh, you know, the opportunity to travel now that things are opening up a little bit more. Um, but yeah, the, the, in the last few years in particular, there's been a lot of negative stories around languages, but I think that it, as long as we keep hitting everybody with positivity, then that's all we can do. Um, so in relation to rec- recruitment, um, yeah, absolutely. That's That's been uh, the case for a, a long time now. I think that, you know, language teachers are um, are in demand or, or are a scarce being in lots of ways. I, my understanding is when there are, there are um, jobs ant- advertised for language teachers that there are lots and lots of people who apply as long as it's, you know, if it's a good school, of course, in, in other situations, my understanding is, say, for roles of heads of department and and, and other such, uh, or maybe director of languages, sometimes um, it's very difficult to find people to apply. I suppose that's the nature of the school in lots mm-hmm. of ways. So, it, so yeah. I'm, but I, th- I think the most important thing is that we all we all act together, we all support each other, we're all positive about languages, and mm-hmm. that's the way forward. And then you know, and forget well, about it, all the it, negative it stories. A, it can drive a school if you think about sort of the the culture behind what a school is and and what languages can bring it. I, it can be at the centre of that, and I, I've seen amazing things inside MFL classrooms because one of my roles privileged to go into classrooms, and like some of the things that language teachers do, is I'm just like wow, like you know they get them repeating things, they get them doing songs, like yep. you know you get some of the most tricky classes in the whole of the school, and they are just absolutely fantastic in an MFL lesson, and that's you know constant retrieval, constant. It's just the way you teach, and I think I think it's it, it can be complete magic and. You know, when, when we're trying to recruit for them, I just feel really like, come on, like, because languages is such a, an important part of, I think, secondary education. And I've always worked in schools, you know, around sort of deprived areas, I suppose, or a very yeah. mixed match within, you know, mixed ability, like huge range within mixed ability. And I think it's more important than ever to, you know, get them sat around that table if they wanted to with the local private school in 10 years' time and to be able to hold a conversation of their own. And I think languages holds the key to that 
um, or the culture behind it holds the key to that as well. So I, I'm a huge advocate. Yeah, that, that's really good to hear because I think in some schools, unfortunately, uh, the, the senior leadership team aren't necessarily positive about languages or can actually, this, these are stories that I hear on Twitter, you know, are, are vocal about um, saying, say in front of a class, or oh, I was never good at languages at, 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 at school, et cetera, et cetera. So, or sometimes subconsciously, Think they can give that uh, impression and also a lot of teachers talk about when it comes to um, the, the choices they make in year nine about sometimes languages are put up against um, uh, other subjects so that um, it, it, it actually it's very difficult unless you really really want to do a language mm -hmm. then you'll have to then sacrifice something else which maybe you'd, you'd want to do instead so I think um, yeah the, uh, lots of things are stacked against language teachers but as i've said already um i think language teachers work really really hard and are very motivated and, and they have to be because they have to keep the students engaged they have to try and teach the lesson as much as possible through the target language um and i think i think they're wonderful but i would say that wouldn't i <laughs> well, of, co of course but i i also think they're wonderful so in, in your opinion what what makes or what are the fundamental components for a really effective MFL lesson, in your opinion, if you had to. So I asked a, a question, you know, to Tom Sherrington about this before. I've asked it to lots of different people we've done podcasts, and you know, it really puts you on the spot. But if you had to for MFL, because if we've got MFL teachers, you know, listening in and things, obviously you're a huge specialist. That'd be really good for them to find out. And I also told a lot of the MFL teachers that I was doing this podcast, and they were like, "Oh my god, ask him, ask him." <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, if you had to say four or five things. What for you makes a, a really highly effective or just effective um, MFL lesson? OK, well, I think that first and foremost, the most important thing, not just for MFL, but teaching in general, is um, having a good relationship with the class. Uh, so, you know, yeah. personal relationships, I think, is absolutely key. You could be the best teacher in the world or be as organised as, you know, as, as the, the best organised teacher in the world. But if you haven't got that relationship, that rapport with your class and you haven't mm -hmm. established uh, a positive learning environment whereby the children feel you know loved or cared for or that they or that you um that you that they have their interests at heart i think that is the most important thing once you've got that established and that's not necessarily easy to do that particularly with challenging classes but once you've got that established then i think um uh, well personally i think pace is is important to have a good mm. pace as long as you keep uh, the students with you of course at all times i think um as much as possible to try and depending on the length of the lesson to try and do at least um three out of the four skills maybe even all four skills depending on on yeah if it's uh, say an hour lesson then you could try and do all four skills but the most important thing is that you don't sort of um just rush through things that you you, you do things with pace to keep people engaged but you make sure that each activity that you do with them that uh, you know it's nice and meaty that it's um it's differentiated um, that you, um, I would say this, of course, that use technology sparingly when it's appropriate, when it's We're purposeful, when it's that, effective. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, encourage the, the, the students to record themselves um, mm. uh, for, say, audio or video. I think that's a, that's a fantastic thing in general to encourage them to uh, produce multimedia in the, in the lessons from time to time um, and to... Uh, occasionally to to veer away from the textbook I think that's important as well I, I'm a big fan of textbooks but I also think that uh, it's really cool to be able to uh, plan your own um, or create your own resources um, to to um, try and find things that you know that your class are interested in so you have that sort of personal touch um, so that if you if you know that for example lots of your class are like a particular football team or like a particular musician then try and get the language to hang around um, onto onto you know these personalities. So things like you know having a picture of someone with a speech bubble, but in the target language. So making a, a photo yeah, story that's, about yeah, that's really interesting. about yeah. a character. So the kids will, will then feel, I think, that um, you're making it relevant for them. You know, you're you're um, I don't know a bit cool or, or or the fact that the fact that that. Because it's, I don't mean I, it's not all about you know edutainment or anything like that, but I think that I think that the relationships that you have with the students, however you um, you nurture those, is is the most important thing. And if you get that relationship right, then you can do most things. I think. Yeah, I've, so I've just started a, a new job, and I'm I'm back in the classroom a lot. I'm actually teaching geography. I, mean, I do it a little bit, but I'm a historian. Um, so there's that aspect to it, but um, it's all about relationships. So this is my second week. Um, I work. I work point six teaching. I do other things within the other time, but um, you know, 
I, I can I can do or plan the whizziest lesson in the world, think about my pace, think about, but unless I have those relationships, it, you know, it, that comes first. So that's what I'm working on. Um, and it, it's going to take me a few weeks because it takes anybody a few weeks, if not half a term, a term to get that with some of your classes. And once you've got it, then you can really play around with it. So the fact that you've said that, I think, a few times within your answer, I completely agree. Cause I, I Thank just, you. Thank like, you. I'm I mean... really worry li living through it again at the moment. Yeah, I, I also so I thought also important. think that um, that speaking is also really important. I think that speaking can lead to lots of other things. So, for example, um, uh, when I was teaching, I was uh, I took part in what was called the talk project, which was yes. um, uh, around the uh, sort of early two thousands, and I got really really into it. And I, it was uh, it was essentially like immersive, immersive teaching, really. So I was um, as much as possible using only the target language. I had lots of grammar posters all over my walls, as well as some. Uh, uh, like cultural posters, like uh, movie posters, things like that. So I would regularly go to to Calais and to uh, this uh, City of Europe, which is um, a big shopping mall, and 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 spend whatever it was thirty uh, euro at the time on magazines, and do this like three times a year. <laughs> and so I got got the latest magazines. But having having all those grammar uh, prompts and um, and verb paradigms and high frequency words and all this sort of thing, um, which is now very popular now with the new GCSE, but I was doing it years and years ago. And um, I used to have this um, this wooden spoon, like you know, one of those like large um, uh, sets of like a, a wooden spoon and a, and a wooden fork. I used to go to car boot sales regularly yeah. on a Sunday morning, and I'd pick up one of those and I would use it to be able to you know point at different um, um, uh, verb forms or grammar points. And <laughs> I, I can imagine you doing this. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and they, the, the kids used to think it was a bit zany, but but I think they really liked it. And so a lot of the work was. Um, uh, through speaking and then translation work and they would they they would be able to work out that it was all a bit of a game so it didn't actually matter that what they were saying wasn't necessarily you know uh, truthful or that they you know as long as they were able to manipulate the language and mm. say things that were a bit silly that would make other people laugh uh, it was it was cool and, and and that was that was amazing so i found that was one of the key drivers in addition to all the to talk, all the yeah, things we did with technology talk, that, that that engagement that speaking practice the fact that i could you know encourage them to use the target language as much as possible to communicate in the language uh, and I'm still a big fan of that as well but um, that that was that was something which I found to be very very effective. Um, yeah. I think that, that, that can resonate to all different subjects especially as you said you worked cross-curricular quite quite a bit and I think the use of getting the students to talk about the subject, use that core knowledge, yeah. use that target language. That's yeah. really powerful. And I think so I've gone into a new setting and I've, I'm I'm either getting classes that are a little bit off the wall or are you know, not, you know, not getting much back. So you have to really train them to, you know, it's okay to talk about, as long as you talk about the target language because that's how it, you know, goes into your brain. That's how you remember it. Um, I think that's really interesting. Just, just, uh, talking um alluding to another point because you picked up there what what would your classroom look like now in comparison to perhaps when you started teaching because there's loads about sort of visual classrooms and about what best practice is so what would your classroom yeah. first of all what would it have been like and what perhaps would it be like now or would it have been the same um that's a great question that's a great question okay oh, so I when i first when i first started teaching um uh, it was probably well in in because I, I as I said I did my PGC in North Wales I then taught there for two years um, and I didn't have lots and lots of things on the wall I I started getting into that whole idea of 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 getting um uh, you know cinema magazines and uh, music magazines and that sort of thing but it tended to be those sorts of things more than um, uh, grammar grammar uh, sheets and 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 posters and, and things like that so. When I when I went to the middle school um, at the end of the uh, 90s, uh, my head teacher, who I got on really, really brilliantly with, he um, he said to me that he wasn't quite sure about uh, my classroom in the sense that it was very, what's the word? Um, busy. I think the word was busy. It was very busy. So I literally covered all the walls right up to the ceiling. And um, it was a little bit of a, like a goldfish bowl because on one of the walls there was um, lots of glass. So he would regularly bring um, prospective parents along and, and get them to look in through the uh, the window. So I like covered everything with with posters. Um, but he then he said to me, you know, um, that a little bit later he realised, having observed me quite a few times, that actually. I was very much using the classroom as another teaching aid, and that was exactly what I was trying to do. So I was trying to do the like the 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 the, the grammar 
ideas. Um, I put them on fluorescent paper as well, so they would naturally catch the eyes of the children, and I I've laminated exactly them as well. This. I used to have I, my keywords. Yeah. There we are. I, I put them so I had the board behind me, um, and then I had all those fluorescent grammar things um, around the side of the board, so the children would be then looking at that all the time and hopefully Sensory picking things up um, <laughs> in a in a sort of you know um, subconscious way and then all like the film posters or what have you would be either lower or higher or on the side but all the grammar things which I wanted them to look at as much as possible were right in front of their eyes because I had a horseshoe I'd always, always had a horseshoe and then the as I said the glass um, the little windows on the on the side were uh, uh, again I would put other sort of cultural things and as well as some um, children's work of course but but I just thought uh, if I have everything on fluorescent paper that's grammar based, then that should catch their eyes and, and help them to remember things subconsciously. That was the idea, which I think it did work, actually. So what, what would you do now? Would you do the same? I would, I would do the same, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, well, I, I kept I obviously I've not been in the classroom now for a few years, but I I found uh, that having everything really busy like that um, was something that worked worked for me. I think the children uh got used to it really quickly they liked the way in which i would refresh the um the movie posters on a regular basis i would also choose lots of posters which had um uh vocab in it that they would need at, at say key stage three i remember we had a poster for the sixth sense with bruce willis um the fact that they need to know the um okay. em um um uh structure uh the ccm songs for example uh, and lots of other lots of other um posters i would <laughs> i know it sounds a bit sad but anyway but i would deliberately choose posters because of the fact they had certain words in them which mm. i knew they would have to cover in key stage three and key stage two because at, at the middle school which is where i really sort of blossomed as it were but i think um, i think that proves yeah it proves there's so many arguments for and against so i know that i know what oliver Cavigioli would say about this because of the sensory i'm audio, sure yeah i'm everything. sure i know that yeah. i get that but yeah. actually doesn't it prove to you got you got to be comfortable in your environment but also the students would probably think you know what he really cares about us because he's yeah. he's chosen those posters he's gone to france to get them and now he's talking about them and he's teaching through them and he's done that for us to sit here and to have an enjoyable lesson and i think there's a lot to say about that so it goes back to relationships as well so so a lot uh, interesting thing to talk about though isn't it but i think um, as well in, rela in relation can i just, can I just say in like relation it. to say powerpoints things like that because i was i remember the head teacher, he got the data projector in uh, when it was about 2004, I think. And he was a, I think he was a little bit miffed about the fact that there weren't um, as many people using it as should have been, if anyone at all. So I said, OK, I always love a challenge. So I decided to convert all my uh, OHPs into PowerPoints, which took me quite a long time, I remember. Yeah, and sure. then yeah. Um, uh, around yeah, 2004, 2005, that's when I really started um uh, using using PowerPoint in that sort of way uh, for presenting um, vocabulary. And I, it was very much sort of, even though my classroom was very busy, the actual PowerPoint in related to say dual coding and what have you, I, it was very um, sort of stripped back and mm -hmm. I didn't have uh, lots of fussy things on the PowerPoints. Um, but yeah, my classroom in general, it was it was very busy, I must yeah. admit, yeah. I've, I've definitely stripped back my PowerPoints as well. So I used to present everything in yellow. Don't know why, it's my favourite colour, okay. obviously. <laughs> And, and it became a bit of a joke where I used to work and they used to, they presented me with lots of yellow things when I left. Um, but my PowerPoints were so busy, they were so colourful, like, and I've completely stripped it back and I, I use the dual coding and it, it does really, really work and it works really effectively. But I also like my classroom to be my environment and that has to have my personality in and I have to feel comfortable yeah, in it. So absolutely. I, I also yeah. agree with that. So just, just moving into, you mentioned some technology there. So talk to me a bit about technology because obviously you are an expert in this field. Uh, you're really passionate about it. So how do you use that within your teaching? How would you you know, advise teachers to use it? Well, talk to us about that. Okay, well, I think there are, there are two main ways in which um, you would want to use technology in languages. One would be that sort of uh, receptive um, quizzing, uh, retrieval practice type of uh, way of using technology, using tools like you know Quizlet and Mentimeter and quizzes and those sorts mm -hmm. of things. The way in which it can um, encourage independent learning, the way in which the children can use a mobile device and can learn on the on the move. Um, in fact, uh, recently I was um, I was doing what I call a clinic session with the British Council, which was um, I uh, I put together like a Google form and I asked the people who are going to be coming to the webinar if they can. Um, uh, write me some questions just to break things up a little bit so it's not just like me choosing what the content's going to be but but um, uh, I'm actually aren't um, answering the questions that they put in 
And one of the questions that came up, which I thought was fascinating, was around um, the, the use of technology in quizzing tools. And the question was, um, do you think that quizzing tools such as Quizlet are more about um, teacher efficiency? In other words, saving the teacher time uh, through uh, the self-marking um, types of tools like that. Or is it more to do with um, student learning? Which I thought was, sort of, was a great, great question. So, mm -hmm. I, of course, I asked the MFL Twitterati what they thought about this. And we had some lovely responses like the algorithm that you get with these sorts of tools such as Quizlet. Um, allows the, uh, the, the, the student to be reminded of the words they need to work on. Um, the way in which, as I said, they can work on the on the on the move. They can uh, it can promote independence. Um, if they are not particularly organised, it can help with that as well. In the mm -hmm. way that it can send you reminders, or in the case of say Duolingo, um, it can uh, send you um, uh, reminders via email. You can go on streaks um, to encourage you to carry on with the learning, uh, as well as all the other things like the the teacher effic efficiency as well. But I thought that was really interesting. So. That would be one side, I think, of using technology. And then the other way, uh, as I sort of alluded to earlier, is this idea of uh, promoting speaking and writing skills in particular, the way in which you can use multimedia to um, record your voice, to make little videos, to make animations, to make animated GIFs, to do uh, collaborative writing and say um, a collaborative PowerPoint or a collaborative um, uh, class notebook in a Microsoft environment. Yeah, you need to come and train me up on this. <laughs> <laughs> That, uh, you know, and then and then also, I think um, that, that the power of audio feedback is really, really good in languages as well. So using tools like Moat, for example, I think that something that um, uh, I've been talking a lot about recently, uh, Moat is uh, some of the, some of the, the teachers I've been training um, face to face as well as online have been saying that they were have been using a lot more verbal feedback um, as a result of the pandemic than they maybe had done before. So I think lots of teachers. Um, they maybe get a bit bored with um, always doing the same sort of um, uh, the same sort of thing. They, they always love um, variety, and so in relation to uh, let's say remote teaching or hybrid teaching, um, based on based on the different Facebook groups I'm part of and uh, and the MFL Twitterati, they're always looking for you know the next the next tool to look at. Or my children are bored with Kahoot. What's a, a tool which is like that and those sorts of things. So I think that. Having that variety uh, there is is also really important. And one of the things um, that I think definitely some teachers have been playing with is the idea of verbal feedback. So using mm -hmm. tools like Moat, which seem to have really taken off um, in the last so uh, this, last couple of years. Would, and... I had a question from um, a music teacher who's obviously really struggling with you know how how do you assess the impact? How do you showcase the impact without physically doing something for the sake of doing it, or for the sake of doing it for offset or an external visitor? And so. Uh, uh, I was sort of playing around with sort of different verbal feedback tools. So is that is that the one that you would suggest at the moment? Um, well, I think um, there's different ways of doing um, uh, verbal feedback. There's tools like Showbee as well. There's uh, with Class Notebook, it's very easy to um, record audio. And um, uh, you could, for example, have a table whereby you assign different students to different cells in that table mm -hmm. uh, to do like a live uh, writing um, exercise whereby uh, you have a table with the students putting their names or, or the teacher puts in their names in different cells. They then write their little paragraph uh, in another um, uh, in another column. And then in the third column, the teacher's giving uh, feedback in real time, which could be written feedback, but they could give audio feedback as well. So then the, the student then sees what the feedback is and then responds to that in real time. So again, I think one of the great things about technology is the way in which it can give um, just-in-time feedback or, or immediate feedback mm. in some cases, like if it's a it's a quizzing tool then uh, you can you can be told straight away if it's right or wrong or if it's like say a writing exercise uh, the teacher can give written feedback or they could give spoken feedback and then the the child can then act on that straight away so i think that there's different ways of doing it but i think that certainly moat in a google environment in particular although you can, you could use it in a microsoft environment as well with the with the moat pad the way you can record audio and then uh, post the link wherever you want i think that that seems to be something um, which has really taken off. And I've, I've heard lots of teachers saying, oh, yeah, I absolutely love Moat. I'm using it all the time. It's absolutely brilliant. So mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly something which um, uh, myself and other people have been talking about for years and years. Uh, the idea of audio feedback or audio QR, or audio QR codes, for example. But I think what Moat did really, really well is just uh, made it so simple and easy to uh, so how produce. How do you spell that? Uh, so M-O-T-E. Oh, M-O-T-E. Okay. So and it's, yeah, and it's, uh, it's a Chrome extension. Um, and uh, the, the, the first way in which um, you could use it was to, whenever you get a comment box in Docs, Slides, or Classroom, you get a little 
purple um, circle with a white M in it. You would just click on it and then you could give an audio, a bit of audio feedback as a comment. Then they introduced the mote to slides option, um, which means that you then click on the same uh, uh, same icon, but um, within the, the slide presentation, Google Slides, and then you can record the audio straight within the slide, which is obviously for languages brilliant for um, uh, oracy and, and, and practicing mm -hmm. your speaking. And then they've done other things like with Google Forms now, you can have the little mouse icon in the question, so good for listening comprehension. And then in multiple choice, you can have each answer can be an audio uh, player uh, as opposed to a written uh, possible answer. So that's so that's that's really, really good. Anything, any tool which allows you to um, have the opportunity of recording audio as a response or as a um, uh, as a prompt, I think is is really good for languages for lots of reasons for confidence, for pronunciation practice, uh, for modeling, etc. Absolutely. And I think I think there's there's two things as well with it is that keeps up with the kids because obviously that their yeah. technology, they're going to be surrounded by it. that's part of their, their life, isn't it in the future. And also, I think because because of the pandemic, part of what our roles are even more so than it's always been really important, but we've got to pick up on those misconceptions, that mislearning. And I think it can do that really imminently from what, yeah. what you're saying. It's a really good way to, yeah. to be able to identify it, you know, feedback and then, you know, move through your teaching because of it and respond to it. So I yeah, think that's... I, I, I agree with that as well. I also think on that point, um, one thing I noticed a lot at the beginning of the pandemic was there were lots of schools that were saying you're not allowed to do live lessons with, say, Zoom or with um, Google no, Meet or whatever it was that you're using. So there were lots of teachers, I think, who learned for the first time how to make a screencast, even if it was just using uh, a PowerPoint and recording some audio and embedding that in the audio, into the video, sorry, into the PowerPoint and then exporting that as a video clip. Or if they were using a tool like Loom or Screencastify, mm -hmm. the way in which they were learning how they could narrate a PowerPoint so it could be used as a as an asynchronous um a uh, learning resource, almost like like flipping the classroom a little bit. I think I think teachers were amazing. Um, I worked really really hard, and and I was bending over back to try and to help people and support teachers I'm as much sure as you possible. Were, you can yeah. imagine I was being absolutely bombarded by questions, Especially but but I was help. seeing um so on Facebook groups, you know, questions like how do you do a screencast, and 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 there was myself, lots of other people chipping in, and within a few weeks there were you know say three or 4,000 members of, of groups that were just setting up um, around uh, uh, the, with the focus on technology and languages. So it was it was really, really great to see that, I thought. Yeah, no, I agree. And it, like, like you said, it, it just completely flipped everything. So, you know, it forced us to do things out of our comfort zone. And, and actually, I, you know, I'm a historian, I like to stand at the front and I like to talk about history. You know, like, that's my power, that's my knowledge. And, you know, I used to, I used to stand by that. And now it's come back around, that's apparently quite good in the classroom. Um, so, so, you know, being forced to do things more online, um, you know, it was good for me, it was good for my skill set. But also, it, you know, the students really respond to it. They, they absolutely love they love they love it and you know it might take me a few hours to get used to it but then you know bringing that into my my normal day-to-day -day practice it's definitely the benefits of it so thank you um i think what we're gonna do now we're gonna do a, a little quiz so i'm gonna ask you some questions so we can get to know you a little bit more and um the idea is to say the answers as quick as possible if you can <laughs> like right. there, there are some okay. that you might want to talk about in a little bit more detail but it's a really nice way to get to know you as well so my first one to you is what's the best educational book you've ever read or the best blog that stands the test of time for you okay well okay well um my favorite um two blogs at the moment are um what jane learnt next uh, dot yeah. blogspot dot com which is jane bassnet and MFL Craft by Esmeralda Salgado. Um, those I've mentioned in many, many um, different sessions that they are those two blogs are the best blogs by practicing languages teachers with with an evidence based approach. So they're absolutely fabulous. Um, and if you're not a language teacher, you would still gain a lot from them, I think, by seeing the sorts of techie tools that they're using, um, but it, with an evidence-based approach. Yeah, so those are my yeah. two favourite at the moment. Honestly, do these podcasts like free CPD for me? So obviously, I'll be go back in back into my setting and be like, right, uh, NFL teachers, did you know? It's <laughs> um, really useful for me. So uh, the next one, dogs or cats? Uh, cats, I think. Ah, well, I've never, we've never had dogs. I've never lived in a house with a dog. Um, I've lived in in a house with various cats over the years. So yeah, cats, I think. Yeah. He's a definite cat man. Uh, wine or beer? It doesn't have to be either. 
uh, beer probably, although I hardly drink nowadays. Um, but I've just just recently been doing lots of work in uh, Dublin, and so I've been having a few Guinnesses. But the first Guinness I had uh, a few weeks ago was the first alcoholic drink I've had in about two years because of the lockdown and everything. And I'm not a big drinker anyway, but I have had a few Guinnesses now, having had a few trips to Dublin working with uh, European teachers. They advised uh, pregnant women to drink Guinness, so there we are. (laughs) (laughs) It's good for you. Uh, iPhone or Android. Uh, right, great great. I um I have an iPad, but I have an Android phone simply ah. because again, when I went to um uh Dublin the first time, I had to have a phone to have the passenger locator form, so I couldn't go unless I had a phone and I wanted to get the cheapest phone I could and I decided to go for an Android one and having used it now, I do like it, but when I upgrade or change, should I say, when the contract uh, stops, I'll probably go for an iPhone as well because I'm a bit yeah, of an Apple enough. Uh, what's your dream but, job if it wasn't what you're doing already? Um, it's probably what I'm doing already. I know that's a very boring answer, that's great. but um, I would I would like to do more international keynotes. That would be my dream or an extension of what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, so I would like to do more uh, international keynotes and do more Take traveling I'll, I'll um, happy to do that internationally. With you. Sorry? I said, I'll come with you. Uh, <laughs> once, yeah, once no problem. Bag. Anytime. <laughs> Uh, right. What's your biggest regret professionally or personally? I don't mind. Um, my biggest regret. Um, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a hard question. <laughs> we can that's park a it and come back. Um, I'll have a think about that. Yeah. What's your biggest achievement? My biggest achievement, um, I think probably helping to nurture the MFL Twitterati because mm-hmm. I think that that's had a massive impact on thousands and thousands and thousands of teachers over the years. No, and absolutely has. Um, yeah. I used to work in a very small school and basically one M- MFL teacher and um, they'd find them, like, they used to work across the trust. So there'd be MFL teachers across the trust, but it's not the same as having people on the ground with you. And the first thing I did was introduce them to your MFL Twitter. Um, and that was cool. because the MFL teacher that left previously told me all about it. So it's, it just, it, it makes people feel less lonely because there's a lot of schools out there where you are on your own. Um, okay, exactly. so who do you think I should interview next and why? Um, okay, I think uh, if we're talking about someone in the UK, I would suggest that I mean Esmeralda Salgado or Jane Bassnet. I think are fantastic yep. people um, to interview. Um, if we're talking about internationally, um, I'm a massive fan of Greg Kulawick, who yep. is the man behind the term app smashing, uh, which he coined back in 2013. The idea of of um, uh, using, let's say, an iPad or the, it's not a device specific, but using um, uh, a device to create um, different types of multimedia content, but pulling them all together with a final outcome. So, for example, uh, making a comic strip um, and then putting that into another uh, tool and making um, an audio recording, uh, an uh, uh, audio narration of that comic strip and then publishing it to a real audience and getting feedback. So very much sort of hitting the top level of the summer model. Uh, if you know, if you've heard of that as a as a as a um, uh, 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 an educational technology theory, the summer model, I think that app smashing for me at the time tied in very much with um, the redefinition level, the, to- the top level of the summer model and app smashing. So if you do a search on Twitter for app yeah, smashing and my name, uh, you'll find uh, lots and lots of references. Yeah, you can get double ticks for that. Um, when you go on a holiday, do you prefer to be a swimmer or a sunbather? Uh, neither, really. <laughs> um, um, I'm, I'm certainly not one of these people that likes to, to, to lie around on a beach. I've just never, never done that. I would want to be uh, going for walks, um, mm-hmm. enjoying the uh, enjoying the nice weather, but for going for walks in woods or uh, in fields, that that sort of thing. I'm much more of an adventurer than uh, someone that sits on on the beach. Well, maybe, um, I do swim, but I'm not a big swimmer. Start a new uh, project where you're doing sort of combining MFL with forest school. Ah, and, uh, well, one one of my favourite things, one, one of my favourite things on my happy place is going for a walk on the Isle of Wight, because on the Isle of Wight, uh, back in the 1950s, um, uh, Beeching, the, the very unpopular minister at the time, decided to get rid of all these um, uh, railway lines that weren't financially viable. And as a result of that, on the Isle of Wight, because uh, there were railway lines everywhere, they were all turned into uh, sort of cycle paths, which means that on a on a sunny day, you can walk as far as you want to walk um, in the in the countryside, 
um, with the wind in your hair in your hair and uh, have a great great time and listen to a podcast at the same time that's one of my favorite things to do listen to a podcast while going for a walk and just you know taking in the world and uh, reflecting yeah that's definitely one of my favorite things in the world sounds sounds like a good uh, a good piece of advice for a teacher that needs a little bit of a break and to sort of massage their well-being as well so my last question uh for for this sort of podcast is what's what was your favorite memory at school or your favorite teacher yeah okay so my favorite teacher at school was my spanish teacher um and the reason i really liked him it was because of the fact that he was um uh, he was very funny. I felt he was very authentic. I felt that he was uh, he was being himself. He wasn't uh, it wasn't like a facade. Um, and uh, I did uh, a level with him. A, a funny story was uh, when I went to the the grammar school. Um, initially, I didn't want to do um, Spanish. I wanted to do technical drawing instead. But because I was um, pretty good at French, they didn't allow me to do technical drawing. They suggested that I had to do Spanish instead. And then I went on to do it, do it for A level. So he was a real inspiration. Uh, for me and um yeah i just thought he was cool and he would yeah just just authentic and he he made me laugh a a lot um i think well that goes back to your point doesn't it it's all about relationships because i i did history or became a history teacher i mean i i I failed as a snowboarder so it wasn't my first like thank thank god my parents said uh, i wasn't very good at snowboarding but it was because i liked and respected my history teacher um, and I did geography for A level because I thought they were really fun. And you know, there's more to it than that. Obviously, I really, I really, really enjoyed and you know their their lessons. And it's because they have a relationship with them, and that's what it all always falls back to. Yeah. I think. Um, so I'm going to do another question, even though I said that was my last question. Just yeah, because, no problem. Um, you're an MFL teacher, and I'm interested. What's what's the best ever trip you've taken students on? Right. So when I was at the middle school, um, we used to go to um, a place called Sa- uh, San Carlo Guido, which is in Brittany. Mm-hmm. And um, that was, yeah, that was the, the best trip um, um, that I, I took the, the, the children on. It was absolutely fantastic seeing them uh, go to the market in Matignon, for example, and uh, actually use their French to, to buy a pancake or to, um, uh, to barter for something, whatever it might be. Uh, to to go to Mont Saint Michel and for them to walk up the um, the path and to see uh, the abbey and to 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 get a real sense of you know real language and a real place in context which is part and parcel of what I think language learning is all about. So to actually see uh, the children doing that and, and also the fact that we took some uh, children from let's say more impoverished backgrounds that maybe wouldn't have had that opportunity mm. uh, beforehand. The way that that um, uh, really. I think really helped them and also the way in which you get to know some children in different ways that you that you didn't know beforehand because of the fact you're not you know sort of with them 24 7 and obviously in the classroom and you get to see for example um their eating habits you might get some students who will only want to eat um uh, processed food all the time or awesome. moan about this and moan about that yeah. or you know what so I, and then when you come back to the the school afterwards the relationships that you then um mm. Uh, 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 nurtured and benefited from as a result of those trips I think that will last um, uh, for a lifetime or, or the memories that you can create for a trip uh, can really help with the relationships that then you have with the students afterwards as well so that would be my favorite uh, trip uh, hands down I absolutely loved it each year we did it. Oh, it's really lovely to hear and I, I think um, as I am sure you agree I think trips are can be everything for a curriculum it can bring it alive and uh, and as you say, the memories and the relationships is there's nothing quite like it, is there? No. Um, oh, I think that that sort of comes to the end of the podcast. Um, so thank you so much uh, for your time this evening, Joe. Um, I think we've had a lovely chat, and I've learned a lot about MFL teaching. And uh, you've been a fantastic guest, which I knew you would be. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And I hope my sound sounded good with my lovely ATR twenty one hundred X microphone. Well, I hope mine does that, too. That's the most uh... important thing. My audio quality, Libby. <laughs> well. We'll, we'll 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 make sure we uh, we'll give you a uh, feedback on that. But I'm sure it sounds <laughs> fantastic. Cool. <laughs> so thank you again.